but it's a great Sunday school uh, opportunity for people of all ages. Now tonight's service is going to be a little different than normal. Tonight's service is five, we're going to have a, it's called, I put all church carrying dinner, that doesn't mean you carry in each other, okay? <laughs> Bring them the food, it's carrying, carrying food for that, all church carrying dinner, that starts at five o'clock, and then we go into our worship time. It won't be small groups tonight, but we're going to have a worship time tonight, uh, six after the, uh, after the church dinner. Ladies, I feel it's been in there women and faith and fellowship for this Wednesday. That is this Wednesday from 9 to 11. We'll be meeting next door over at the Annex. A great gathering there for the ladies fellowship. Then in the evening on Wednesday at 6, we have our adult Bible study. And also we have Tech Cadets for the youth. We were going to have a, a presentation for our Tech Cadets today. One of our kids uh, is ready to see one of the badges, but uh, Casey is downhill this morning. She won't be with us. And so uh, we'll be connecting her later. This coming Saturday, from 9 to noon, kind of like spring cleaning time around the building here. Please, no matches, no gasoline. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're just going to get some loose up the place and uh, be ready for uh, spring cleaning and kind of, kind of sort of ground the world look nice for that daughter supper. Ladies, you get like, excited about that. Does that make you look good or what? <laughs> All right. Uh, you have a great time for that, the daughter supper on May 9th. You don't have to have daughters to bring that. If you're a daughter, come. Okay, it's not a mother daughter here, it's just daughter. You come if you're a daughter, and if you have daughters, bring your daughters with you. And uh, one other note that didn't put in there on the back bulletin board, you see all those colorful speaking notes. That's for the KB Bible School. A couple of those have already been taken, some of the needs that we have. We'll take a look at them. They're numbered. By the way, the number of the card does not indicate how many of the things we need of that item. <laughs> just let me know. That's my story about that. But anyway, when you take one of those, those notes, would you also sign your note on the corresponding number on that paper just so we know who has what number? Does that make sense? All right, so if you have questions about it, you have to let me know. Today, I'm going to invite all the kids to come up on stage with me. They've been me the last seven weeks. They said, when are we going to sing our Jet Cadet song? When are we going to sing I Can Count on God? Guess what? We're going to do it in five seconds. Come on up, kids, and help us with the most. We have to stand. All right? We'll kind of help you with the most. Is everybody on our feet? All the kids who want to come up, come on up. We're going to sing I Can Count on God. Yeah, this is my favorite too. How you doing, guys? Oh, Let's start out like this. God is strong. God is strong. 
God is number one. I can count on God. 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 I can count on God.
it's, it's a really anxious fellowship because as the week goes on and as the concerns and the burdens press in, all this it, it, the diet doesn't we begin to lose that. How, how long does it take for you in the time of gathering together and all the excitement? How long does it take for that to kind of fade away at least? A day or two, maybe ten minutes? I mean, because when you get out of it, boom, the world gets done. You can know that God's with us. And not only God with us, we're with each other and have each other. And that's a blessing to have this fellowship together in Christ. One of the greatest blessings we have, besides the Lord's Supper, is to be able to come to God in prayer and bring our concerns. We also have a listing of those burdens in our worship bulletin this morning. I'm going to go over those with you uh, for a few moments here for a minute. The board of that prayer, and Brother Lon's going to be in this prayer after uh, the song for the century of uh, prayer time. We believe the most important partnership a person can have in life is the relationship with Jesus Christ. If a person's not saved, that's pretty bad news because they need Christ. And so that's why we always put that at the top of our head. We all know people who know Jesus. In fact, when you look in the mirror this morning, we're one of those people. We're not glad that you have it. So let's pray that others find him as we have. Richard still at Trinity West. Richard Campbell is normally in my position right here. He's in room 624. And kids, I uh, told him that we were singing I count on God. He says, he says, I'm actually learning. Where's that song? He said, you, you tell those kids that though I'm not with them in body day, I'm singing with them in spirit. So um, Richard says, I'm Barb Shan. Well, so good to see you today. And I believe I have a note here prepared for you. Uh, this is from Barb. She says, The outpouring of prayers, cards, letters, food support is unbelievable. Thank you all so much. I am diagnosed as lung cancer with a 60% chance of recovery from the trauma. I'm optimistic, I feel good, and my house is running smoothly with all my health. And that's JR included. <laughs> <laughs> Doris Christie. Doris is back at West in Trinity West. She's room 250. Family still doesn't really have any answers to what's happening. So again, uh, pray for the family. And uh, Brother Glenn also needs a couple of surgical procedure this past week. Um, and as we're going down through those, there's several of you who have been in the hospitals and been visiting. We want to thank you for your ministry there. That's so, so special. And that's good to see you too. Trust that you are feeling better. Let's go more after tomorrow. Let, let it know. Okay, let's go a little more after tomorrow. We can continue to pray for you there. Peg Ryan. Peggy is normally with us on Wednesday night studies. Uh, she was under the weather this past week. And on Wednesday night, we had a crazy fleet. All we know is he's ill and he's healthy. The doctors don't know what the illness is. Linda Berard. Uh, is Denise's sister in law. Uh, still trained to East. Lives with the other day from 14. Uh, home with Valentin. Still got the same about being special, special unit right now, on this day to day, with her daughter Cindy. Please continue prayers there. Casey was supposed to uh, uh, receive a bag this morning, but she was up all night with extreme pain from a condition with her tooth that she needs to know. Upon. The good news is that they did finally get uh, the insurance to agree to cover her procedure. It's a four thousand dollar procedure. Good news is the insurance finally agreed. And she is scheduled for May 16th for the first cancellation. Not hers, but <laughs> if there's any other cancellations, they'll, they'll put her in as soon as possible. Also, prayers for Heidi Scott. Uh, Heidi is having an allergic reaction, and I think she said she was hospitalized. Is that right? Uh, mm -hmm. They were keeping overnight. They were keep her overnight, okay. So, prayers for Heidi Scott. And also, a thank you from uh, the Billy Snyder families, from Landon, Denise, Bill, Tim, and the whole family. A uh, thank you for the beautiful chimes from Mom's funeral. We truly appreciate all the prayers and support during this difficult time. Also, thank you to everyone who had a part in the dinner. Everyone worked very hard and truly appreciate it. Um, you're welcome. Thank you. The whole church family. We love you. We sing the prayers. Thank you for the <coughs> Is there anyone I've missed this morning? Lori. Okay. Bessie's cousin Lori, we appreciate the prayers for her. 
uh, the president lives in Youngstown. Uh, she also has cancer, but they told her there's nothing in cancer. And they gave him about three months. How old is she? 16. It's tough, you know, it takes another to figure out why. Why? I just keep telling people we go back to the garden of Eden. We had no death or anything like that. When Adam and Eve decided to disobey God, that's when death entered the world. But technically, all bets are off since then. People come up to you and say, Well, you shouldn't have to be going through this. But we did. And God allows it. And if anybody says, Well, where was God? And my loved one died. Where was God? in this happened. Where was God? He's the same place he was when he saw his own son die on the doctor, watching over him, protecting him, keeping him. Then, like always, what happens, he doesn't like seeing it, but thankfully we have him there with us. So, when we pray, it means something when we close our prayers in Jesus' name. The song says, He knows my name. Have a father that's given everything, everything to the can about us and truly cares. So, as we sing this, we have to find comfort. Also, one other, I left out, I forgot to put it in there. Just see this in the mail. You never know. You open these things up in the mail, and it's like, what are they wanting? You know? <laughs> and uh, it's a picture of a young fella. I'll pass this around. Hi, my name is Ty Lamon. I'm six years old, and I live in Wellsburg, West Virginia. I have aortic bicuspid valve, and I have open heart surgery on April 29th at 830. So it's what, 26? That'd be Wednesday. So Wednesday morning, 8.30, let's pray for time. He says, my pain is leading the power of prayer, and I'd really like it if you could pray for me in my pain. Thank you. Let's start that one out here. Let's go ahead and sing. Let's pray for us in the God of the Jews. such a pleasure to be 
one of them. My prayer also is to pray for this little guy, which his name is Ty. He's going into surgery. It's going to be tough. His family, it's going to be rough on them, obviously. But uh, what's really neat is he believes that you will hear him and help him. It's so good to see Bart today and see all the struggles he's going through with her family. It's just neat. Uh, you know, we see that prayer is answered. And also my prayer that you'll be with the rest of our prayer list, the people that Dean mentioned today that need help. Be with the ones that are uh, their caretakers. It is sometimes that job is so, so very hard. But uh, I just thank the Lord that there are people that do take care of us. It is also my prayer that you'll be with Casey. As they say that her toothache is 10 times more powerful, more painful than a regular toothache. So be with her and be with Tom and Kim as we go through all this. But uh, be with each of us, please. We thank you, and most of all, we thank you that your son came and died for us, that we will be able to spend glory, and we will get to see our loved ones once again. In Jesus' name I pray. <laughs> I received a letter from Ty's family. There was no return address on it, so even if we wanted to send something to them, we can't. I don't know the address. I'd be able to read it and find out what it is. Each Lord's Day, we go to church, met. Sometimes we had to meet on the ground, we didn't have privilege, maybe be in a place like we have today. Sometimes we met in the homes, but when we were persecuted, we often went on the ground and went into hiding. Caught and certain killed, much like many of the people today. We had every Lord's Day to come together and have a conversation. Because we know that they knew the importance of uh, uh, two important words. And uh, in fact, one of our men in Sunday school class this morning shared this with us about two of the most important words in English language. And when you say these, these words, I'll we'll see if you can tell me what they are. These two words bring love and joy, and peace and harmony. Two words in the one. Yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> we had the same reaction. We were like, because we were all trying to think of like, I love you, God. And someone said, I love you. And so my communion meditates is the two most important words. Around the Lord's table and everything. Yes, God. Yes, God. Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> King of my life, I crown thee now, thy son will be. Blessed I will be my Lord crowned love, be crowned love. Bless I forget Bless I forget thy name. Bless I forget my Lord Show me the two as I will more than well. Angels and of light are me, Bless I forget this Bless I forget thy name. Yes, I will 
Heavenly Father, we'd like to come to you now. Thank you for this past week for being with us and watching over us and showing us that you truly do love us. Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you for everyone that is here today because they are here to worship you. Because you are our king in heaven. You're the one that sent your son down to earth as a small child and baby. He was raised and the whole time. He knew what was gonna happen. And I thank you for this. Because it was your strength that you gave him that he could endure everything that he did. And it is your strength now that you give each and every one of us <coughs> and helps us through. Now, Heavenly Father, there's the men stand at this table to do your job, to serve the bread that is upon this table. And would you bless them and be with them? And would you bless the bread that is upon the table? Because we know that it is a symbol of your son, Father. It was sinless. And it was the whole time. And he took the sins of the world upon him when he came on the cross. And we bless the bread that is here for each and every one of us. We bless each and every one of you takes it. Thank you. It's part of God's chapter one, the chief equation of the grace of Thank you, Father, for your holy word. This child by the Holy Spirit. That the Thomas should be the Lord who this life we have to turn to be the Lord of the Son, not his Father, but the Lord of the Gospel. We thank you now for this time for our table as we bless the food of the vine, cleanse us our soup, make the spiritual resurrection in the book of the Lord, that we live, that we in Christ may have to be one. For we see the last of the Lord of his name. Thank you. 
Anyway, it's on a Wednesday night that she was baptized. You can be baptized any time of day, any time of night. At nine years of age, her daughter had been praying for her for 36 years to come to Christ. And so here she is, about to be buried with Christ. So you can see the ladies. We, when we, we baptize here, we do baptize by immersion. But very important, more importantly, just as important as that, is we baptize people who have made the decision to do so. In other words, we don't baptize you against your will. You ever try to baptize a cat? <laughs> you may get a wonder, but it's not going to have a lasting effect. <laughs> you will definitely remember the struggle. Uh, it's only a person's own choosing when they decide to say, Yes, Lord. Right? Yes, Lord. And uh, so they come. So this is now, she's, she's 10 days old or so in the faith. This is now the second Sunday on the Sunday morning of the Lord's table with the Lord's people. Now, maybe you know it's important for her to be faithful for the end, right? And so that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, being secure, remaining secure. I've got a series of slides that I want to go through. The first one just shows the slide a picture of an anchor. How many of you know it's important that if you have a boat that's going to drop up somewhere, it's important that either if you're out there in the ocean somewhere or in the shore in the harbor, it's important to have an anchor to keep the vessel securely in place where you want it, right? Now, I don't have a picture of an actual mooring, an actual dock where you would, would anchor a ship. But if you've ever seen the sailors get off the ship, come out all these ropes, right? Usually more than one, and they'll, they'll jump off and they'll tether that rope to a mooring or a secure place. And if it's not tied securely, what happens? Something loose eventually, the boat will drift away. On our immersion into Jesus Christ, I want you to think back to me, it was on December 7th, 1969. I was 11 years of age, I came forward on a Sunday night. I remember how the spirit of death come forward to all the people. There was a church dinner. Then after church dinner, they had the service. And at the end of the service, they had trust in the band. And I waited all four verses. We sang four verses back in those days. And I waited until the final chorus. My legs were shaking out. I, I decided I talked to mom and dad about it. I studied my and I wanted to serve Jesus. So I came forward. And I like this lady you just saw. I was immersed in Christ. And so when I was immersed in Christ, just like you, I want you to think back to the the day when you were, okay, when you were baptized. Now, if you can't think back to that, you, if you don't have that vision, then you need to think about whether or not you need to experience this or not, all right? And so, when I was buried with Christ, when we were buried with Christ, uh, the Bible says, people, we, we became secure. We became safe. We were secure. I want to use the phrase, we were eternally secure. And I need to be cautious here, because some, some of the religious world believes that it doesn't no matter what you do after you're baptized, you get to walk away from God. How many of you know we see people baptized and they walk away and so never go back? And they believe they're still saved. And the next time they call the preacher of the church is when they die because they think they need to be buried in the name of the church. But at the same time, I want to put it forth this way upon our immersion in Christ, we were eternally secure in Christ, providing, providing that we are faithful to that. And we'll give you some scriptures here. Don't have these on the slide, so if you're taking notes, drop these down. Providing you're a faithful to death. Revelation 2 10 says, Be faithful to death, then you'll receive the crown of life. So I am eternally secure. We have been eternally secure in Christ, providing as long as we endure to the end. You ever hear the saying that the snail reached the ark by perseverance? You know, <laughs> it's like a Geico commercial where it's dropped off and has to walk to the ship, and it's going to take all day for him to get there. Uh, there is a perseverance in the Christian walk. It, it's a struggle. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, Jesus said, He that endures to the end shall be saved. So even while I'm walking right now and I sin and I fall short of God's grace, yet we are still a part of the family of God. We are still in Christ. And as soon as we acknowledge that sin, we are restored and we are secure again. But I've got to endure to the end, Jesus says, then you'll be saved. I'm eternally secure as well as you as long as we walk in the light. This comes from 1 John 1, verse 7. Talked last week about becoming an overcomer as a child of light rather than being overtaken by the darkness. And we all had the opportunity to choose what the title of that message last week would be. Would we be overtaken in sin and live in darkness and be cast into eternal darkness and hell? Or would we be an overcomer? And at the conclusion last week, I asked him, what is your choice? And I heard several say, I want to be an overcomer. And in 1 John 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light, as he, referring to Jesus, is in the light, 
then we are in fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. How many of you have some sin in your life? Especially in the past, right? Maybe not so much today. You know, maybe you have some today as well. But we all have sin, and we all need it forgiven if we hope to go to heaven. Our trust is in Jesus. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 says that we are secure because we have a hope that, that is an anchor for the soul that goes within the veil. He's using terminology there back in the Old Testament that only the priests, especially the high priests, go into a very holy place known as the Holy of Holies, and only they alone could go and approach the very presence of God. But now the New Testament, to make a long story short on this point, now Jesus is our high priest, and he has gone into the Holy of Holies with his own blood. And when that veil of the temple, there used to be a veil that prevented you from accessing the presence of God. When that veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, it showed that now if we are Christians, if we are in Christ, have Christ as our Savior, we ourselves can go and have personal access in the presence of God. One of the fellows last week, and uh, some prayer need they had, and I uh, said, so, well, we'll be praying with you on that. And he looked at me and said, you probably have a better connection than I do. Now, he's a Christian. He's a fellow Christian. I just went back and said, I have no better access than you. We both have equal access. You understand that? So we have equal access into the very presence of God through the blood of Christ. That's the hope we have. That's what Hebrews 6 talks about. We have this hope that goes within the veil. It's an anchor for the soul. And by merit of the blood of Jesus Christ, by his mercy and by his grace, God did his part in sending Jesus for us. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that he was willing to die on the cross where we should have died? He took our sin upon him. He paid our penalty, our penalty, and as a result of his death and then his burial and his resurrection, we have the opportunity to accept his terms of salvation. So God does his part in sending Christ. We do our part by accepting Christ. God says, I love you. We say, yes, Lord. Not yes, dear. <laughs> yes, Lord. And so, we're buried with him in baptism. We're raised through faith in the working of God. God, Colossians chapter 2. Romans 6, 7, we're free from sin. Ephesians 2, we're raised together and seated in the heavenly places in Christ. And he's added us to the church. We've been sealed by his Holy Spirit. We have been, can you say this word with me? We have been forgiven. Forgiven. We have been saved. We have been saved. In fact, the Bible says in Colossians 1 that we have been qualified by the Father to share the inheritance of the saints in the light. We've been rescued from the domain of darkness. We've been transferred into his kingdom, that would be his church, the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption. Can you say that word with me? Ready? One, two, three. Redemption. That's a word I always thought was hard to understand, but what I appreciate about Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, he actually defines what redemption means. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so someone said to you this week, are you redeemed? I remember when we were trying to change a tire on the Route 22 bridge over at the Ohio River years ago, where a couple of religious folks had stopped to help us. It was one in the morning. We were trying to keep from getting hit from cars. And while I'm trying to pull the tire off, the guy looks at me and says, Are you saved? I'm like, Right. I don't know. I'm a Christian. I'm being a preacher and all that stuff. To be honest with you, right at the moment, it's like, I could care less right now about this conversation. I'm trying to get this tire changed. You understand that, sir? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, are you redeemed? <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, we got the tire changed and all. But next time someone says, am I redeemed? I'm going to say, yes, I'm forgiven. Right? Let's do that. Are you redeemed? Yes, I am forgiven. That's what that means. Our sins are forgiven. Now, how many of you are interested in maintaining these benefits? Right? Eternal security. The doctrine of eternal security is some believe they believe that it doesn't matter what you do after you're baptized, you do whatever you want, you can keep your salvation, right? You keep your salvation, that you'll never lose that. The Bible teaches it is possible to drift away. And we're going to look at some scriptures today that will illustrate that in a moment. First of all, I'd like to 
I invite you to your Bibles on the first scripture on the screen that's going to appear in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. I know we are interested in maintaining our benefits in Christ, keeping those benefits. And what I want to do this morning is share how to maintain those benefits. And I'll tell you right off the top, there are going to be two groups of people in the room this morning. For some of you, this is only going to be a reminder. In fact, for most of you, it's just going to be a reminder. And I realized that. It always bugged me when I went to school. After I went to first grade, I went to second grade. And years later, I learned that the first several weeks, if not the first several months of second grade, was a repeat of what I learned in first grade. I'm thinking, what a waste of time, right? But they just want to remember to make sure I remember those things. So for most this morning, these are going to be reminders. Things like these moorings, these lines, these chains that anchor our vessel to the, not to the dock, but to the rock, to Jesus. These moorings, <coughs> these chains, so we're going to share a few moments. It's just going to be reminders for you. You can come up with these in your own feeling. But yet being together in the power of this, this one room with all these people, I hope to be powerful and reminded and encouraging this week to maintain these more in your life so you don't drift away from Christ, so you don't end up lost. Uh, for the others, that it won't be a reminder, it'll be a revelation. You'll be like, wow, I didn't know that. And that's fine too. And sometimes for those that it should be a reminder, we've forgotten. It'll be, oh, that's right, I forgot that. Okay, I don't need to be reminded of that. In Matthew chapter 27, after Jesus had died, the Jews had come and they approached Pilate and they said, you know, I'll pick up at verse 57 with you. This is after Jesus had died on the cross. This is before his resurrection. In Matthew 27, verse 57, one evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate ordered it to be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his own new tomb, which was turned out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb in one way. Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. So you see the scene. Jesus died Friday evening, sadness over the land. The Jews were devastated, at least the ones that were expecting Christ to be the Messiah. And there's Mary Magdalene there, the other Mary. He's sitting outside the grave. But on the next day, that would be Saturday. This would be the day before the resurrection of Thomas. It was the day of preparation. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said that after three days I have to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made what? To be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and see on the way and say to the people he's risen from the dead, the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go and make it as secure as you know how. They went and made the grave secure. He goes, I'm not afraid to see tears at the early part. They made the grave secure. Along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. How many of you know this man? That those who didn't believe in Jesus want to make that grave secure. How many of you know they gave it to the very best to secure that grave? And how many of you also know what enough to keep him in the grave? Because it was impossible for the grave to hold Jesus, even though they gave their best shot to do that. The question this morning is what about us? What about we who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, servants of God the Father, willing vessels for him to live in us? We who come up claim to be devoted followers. Are our efforts to secure him as Lord in our life as intense and extreme as their efforts to keep him in the grave? I submit to you this morning that if our efforts to secure him as Lord in our life are as extreme as their efforts to keep him in the grave, then we will remain secure. <laughs> they couldn't keep him in the grave. But if we will secure him as Lord, the devil won't be able to keep us out of heaven. All right. Why don't we take a look at some of those things? And before we do, let's go to one other passage of scripture. This next one on the screen, Hebrews chapter 2. Here's, here's what I'm trying to illustrate the danger of not securing these seven moorings, these seven vital links that I want to give to you this morning. 
these vital links, these chains, these ropes, these anchors, if you please. Here's why it's so vital that we have these in our lives. I'm about to share with you. I'm giving it to you yet. When I do, it gives you a quick description of the video, please. But I won't lay the ground. I won't lay the ground. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1, 2, 3. The writer says, For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, so that we do not what? So we do not drift away from it. <laughs> For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, in every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation after it was first spoken through the Lord and confirmed by those who heard? I'm going to go back to verse 1 with you. The whole chapter and the first one is where it lays the picture. The word picture of the word drift. We must pay closer attention to what we've heard and we do not drift away from it. The word that is used there is the word picture of a vessel being moored or anchored to a dock, but not securely. Not securely. The word picture of the word drift, of the result is you're coming in from the journey, from sailing. You're tired, you're weary, you jump off the boat, but what do you have to do to the boat before you come on? You have to secure the vessel. But we're tired and weary, we don't pay real close attention, we're in a hurry, we're hungry. The wife says, Come on, time to stop. <coughs> yes, dear, okay. <laughs> And we just kind of loosely, and we went off. All right, that's one picture. The other picture is where we're going to be staying on the boat. And that's the one I want you to see. The other picture is we finally come in, but we're going to stay on the boat. But we still need to secure the boat. And so we jump off, we kind of carelessly throw the ropes in place, and we go back to the boat. And then while we're on the boat, we're a little, uh, a little tired. That's what we do. This is what happens spiritually. It's a spiritual picture. This is what we just do. The waves are just gently lapping in here. This is new culture. Several hours go by. Who knows how long? But while we're asleep, unbeknownst to us, the lapping of the waves of the boat against the dock causes the boat to eventually loosen and fall off the morning. And while we sleep in the boat, eventually goes out to sea. By the time we awaken, we are out of sight of shore. It's big time. We have no compass. We have no way to find our way home. That's the idea of the drift. That's why I said we've got to be careful attention. Be careful attention. Lest we, lest what we have heard drift. Let, let, lest we drift away from it. So are you, are you interested in taking those moorings and wrapping them securely? All right. Let's go to the next slide. Here they are. In very, very quick word this morning. Making your vessel secure your life. Not to the dock, but to the rock. Here's the first one. Are you ready? If you want to be secure, then first of all, do the due process of actually becoming a Christian in the very real sense of the word. The scripture that I want on the screen for right now today is Acts 2 38. Take a look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is the first time in the New Testament where individuals ask the question of preachers as to what they must do in order to be saved. These were grown individuals. They had heard a, a, a sermon from the Apostle Peter. And I hope you'll read throughout the entire chapter there in the book of Acts. They had suddenly realized that they had crucified their own hope in the side. And as they're listening, they are struck with terror. This is why it's their focal loss. And so they interrupt the Apostle Peter and they said, Let brethren, what shall we do? And verse 38 ought to be the answer given by any gospel preacher to anyone honestly seeking what they must do, assuming they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let me ask you this morning. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe he died for your sins according to the Spirit? Do you believe he was buried? Do you believe he rose again? Do you believe he is Lord? See, the demons believe all that. But these people were not demons. These people were in need of salvation. They had a genuine question, what shall we do? And we honestly answer to give them. Peter gave them in verse 38. He first said, repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so the first chain, the first line of security is to become a Christian 
the very real sense of the word. The Bible says later on there in, the, in that passage, look, they gladly received his word, were baptized, and were added unto them that very day, about 3,000 individuals. But there's a second thing we need to develop as well, because how many of you know, once you become a Christian, now you become a target for the enemy. Satan wants to take you out, right? And how many of you know he's ruthless? He's an adversary that goes around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And this next scripture that's going to appear, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. We must develop a spiritual grit that is willing not only to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, but also to excel in that hardship. In 2 Timothy 2, 3, Paul tells Timothy, minister of the gospel, he says, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. When I stepped forward that Sunday night at age 11, I don't know that I was thinking about all the hardship I was going to endure as a Christian. I don't know that I was thinking about the blitzkrieg, if I can use that term, the German warfare, where they just suddenly unleash an attack on their enemy that's so startling and, and you get them all killed or that they didn't know what to do and the enemy would defeat them. Satan's blitzkrieg is relentless. It calls for mental toughness. It calls for a spiritual grit. To be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And if you've ever thought that becoming a Christian meant that it's going to be easy, and we hear those preachers all the time, don't we? Hey, just give your life to Christ and he's going to bring you riches and glory, and that church is going to be a personal effect as well. You know? No. I'm just found being a Christian is not easy. Wimps need not apply, someone once said. And if anyone looks at you and you feel like you're weak, you ought to offer an apology. You God to offer no apology whatsoever to be a Christian. It's the toughest thing on the planet to be. Is to be someone who would live above the cultural edge, which is the third. Let's go to the next. Two other scriptures here up here. To live above the cultural edge of worldly carnality and lust. It's called moral purity. Once we become a Christian and we begin to try to develop this spiritual grit, you know, this is when you're exercising, don't you? You know, I mean, have you ever done push-ups? I told you uh, a year ago, I tried to do, the guy stood on the stage and do 100 push-ups. And I tried to do four. And I was like, <coughs> <coughs> this was almost asleep, and I was over, and she did me trying to push up towards it. So I began to develop, try to develop a physical grit. Now she asked me, how do you do it? 91 this morning. But it's taken almost a year. How about spiritually to, to develop a mental toughness? It doesn't come overnight. It takes agony. And one of the first ways to develop a spiritual grip is to have moral purity. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. You've got to watch your companions. It's in bad company, corrupts good morals. If you don't know that, go back and revisit the Disney film Pinocchio. And watch what happened when he hung around the wrong crowd. He started to turn into a Donkey, remember that? I'm dating myself now. You want to shake your head? Yes. All that enthusiasm. Romans 12, living above the cultural way. Got to down, study it. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Living above the cultural edge. Here's another one. Let's add another one onto this. How to develop a spiritual grip. Great. A couple more scriptures. Stay connected with the unbroken fellowship of believers. Stay connected with the unbroken fellowship of believers in every week worship and also in your everyday walk. Stay connected with the unbroken fellowship of believers every week in our worship and also every day in our daily walk. Hebrews 10.5 is listed there from the book of the habit of coming together. When we say we are glad to see you today, how many of you know we are glad to see you today? This is where we need to be. This is where we ought to be. Scripture commands that. Then we go away feeling so much better for it. And so when we say, hey, we don't have hope to see you next week. We don't expect to see you next week. We want to see you next week. That's Hebrews 10.5. Don't give up this habit. Don't give up this habit. In 1 John 1.7, we've already referenced. Walk in the light. He is in the light. We have fellowship one with the other. That's powerful. You know that we're not alone. And the blood of the Son cleanses us from all Sin. And I'd like to give you the final three. Having become a Christian, beginning to develop a spiritual grit, these are all moorings, all chains, all roads that do it. Anchor ourselves to the rock. As we begin to develop moral purity with the unbroken fellowship, 
with the body of believers and also with Christ every day. Here are three remainders. That these are package deal. You, you, you just can't take one or two or you know of these. It, actually, all seven of these, and there's probably more. But these three, these three. Scripture of Mark 135. Jesus opened his ministry with prayer. Early in the morning, went out to a solitary place and was praying there. And he closed his ministry with prayer, did he not? Prayer was a constant part of his ministry. If he needed that, how much more do we? In agony, he prayed, My God, my God, let this cup pass from me, if it's possible. But not my will, but what? Not my will, but I am done. So I simply call this unceasing prayer and surrender to his will. And then the, the next two scriptures, John 17, 17, where Jesus says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. The other one from Acts 17, verse 11, talks about a group of individuals, Christians, individuals that were hearing the gospel preached, like you this morning. They were, they were known as the Bereans. And they had open scriptures with open minds. And I love to hear the pages turning. You know, when I call the scripture, although once in a while I looked out for one fellow, I was getting ready to get mad and realized he was on his phone. I was getting ready to hop on him, but he was just, he was, he had the Bible on his phone. Okay. He opened up the bed of prayer and said, but you want, to, you want to have this in your life every day, not just Sunday morning, but to be receiving the, the scripture with eagerness, with, with a hunger, and examining the scriptures, the Bible says, every day. And what I call this is a diligent study, diligent study in search of the truth. Now, I'm a kid, study is a bad word. It's not a bad word. Unceasing prayer. And surrender to his will, diligent study, and search of the light, and search of the truth. Think of the dragon years ago. The fax man is the fax man, right? And then when you go into a court of law, you know, they ask you to swear to tell the truth. Now, but will you what? Tell the truth, the whole truth, and that's about the truth. How do you do that? You can't tell the truth, the whole truth, not about the truth, unless you know the truth. And thankfully, most of us have one of these. This is where you be true. And then that third, that James 5, 19 through 20. The transparent accountability. Surrender. To secure his will. Prayer and surrender to the will. Study and search of his will. And a transparent accountability to secure his will. Um, how many of you have ever been reprimanded for something you did wrong? Here, don't raise your hand. Okay. Go ahead, let's all do it. You've all been reprimanded. Mom and dad, maybe, right? Who else? Who else reprimanded the eve over your life? Let's just, let's just have some flashbacks real quick. <laughs> A teacher? If I said, who's your favorite teacher? It's probably the one that held you to account. You knew they really. Okay, right. They said they took prayer out of school. No, they did. When I went to the principal's office to receive your prayer, which means I'm out of prayer big time. With you. <laughs> Mom and dad, teachers, officer, officer, and reverend. Preacher? Now be honest, did you ever resent it? Did you ever resent it? I did too. I did too. I remember when Jed was just little, uh, we were closing our ministry in Slamville, West Virginia, before he came here to Oakdale. And um, one of my buddies that I was named Jimmy Thorne, he passed away, said, Jimmy said, uh, he told me something right before he came over to me. He goes, said, your son was giving me trouble in Sunday school. I said, what's this, six months ago? <laughs> I said, why don't you tell me? I guess he was afraid to come. I guess I seemed to. I said, what did he do? He said, well, I asked Jed to sit down. He said, I don't have to. My dad's a preacher here. Jimmy was still kind of scared to tell me this, but he thought I needed to know. I said, You should have taken him out back and given him a good living. <laughs> you know, but how many of you know when that happens? The reason, how many of you understand why he was afraid to come here? Come on, let's be honest. What, what's the natural reaction on the time? Someone comes to you and says, Hey, your kid did this, and I'm a little upset, blah, blah, what do you do? You get angry, right? No, oh, it's in it. James chapter 5, that, that final passage. Here. Let him know that he. If you let's look at it, I can't quote it exactly right, so I'm just going to turn it. Let's see. 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 Let's see.
My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, and that's life, like someone asked me the other day, how can you come get all messed up with all these denominations, and how come man so bad like they are? We easily stray. That's why you have to tie up the animal. That's why you have to fence in the animals. The sheep. We all like to keep it on a stray. That's our tendency. So it's very likely you're going to see one of us straying from the truth. And I am openly giving you permission, and we have to give each other permission now, that if we stray from the truth, we give you permission to come and correct us and turn us back to the red light. Because when you do, verse 20 says, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will do what? He will save his soul. You might as well say secure his soul. And will cover a multitude of sins. These are just seven mornings. Seven mornings. They're all essential to stay anchored to the rock. That's so why I'd like to close with this question. The dawn comes, and as we prepare to sing, glory, prepare me to be sanctuary. Here's the final. Here's the final question. Pilate says to the Jews in regard to the tomb of Christ, make it as secure as you can. Now, from me to you, from you to me, in regard to our salvation in Christ, we all ask each other, are we making our relationship with Christ as secure <coughs> as we can? Together, let's do that. Thank you.